Welcome once again to another episode of the Random Access Podcast brought to you by RAPodcast.net. This is episode 803, recorded live on August 24th, 2024, and here are your hosts, the man who was in the same building with me two weeks ago, Dave Pillay. Hey, that's me. And the man who was possibly in the same town as Dave one week ago, Andy Lowe. Hi. Uh, one week ago, like today? Yeah, because I was in Ann Arbor on Saturday. I'm not sure when you had left. At what time? Uh... I was on the road by one o'clock. Hold on. Let me look up my Google Maps timeline. <coughs> Last Saturday, because we were at a birthday party in Kalamazoo. Uh, buh. we were in. We were dre- we just left Kalamazoo at two thirty. So we, you were on the road at one o'clock. We were on the road at two thirty. It's about ninety minutes. Oh, you would have just passed by us. Well, except I went south. Oh, well then, never mind then. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I passed by you. I went. I went south to what I ninety. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Nope, that works too. Yeah, it actually generally works pretty well. Um, it's just longer. Yeah. It is much longer. And you can actually tell me, Andy, if I made the right choice, how was traffic on I-94 coming in? It actually wasn't bad. Damn it. <laughs> Andy, there, you were there supposed was to say the, there was the there was construction. a huge backup. There was that construction by Jackson, yep, which um, is actually worse going east than it is going west because going east they have the highway split into two single lanes for nine miles. So depending on where the semi trucks go, you're either stuck behind a semi truck going semi truck speeds for nine miles, uh huh, and it's just like okay, this you know I really hope nobody gets in an accident because you're literally in a concrete trough for nine yeah. miles. Uh, coming west though, it's still the two lanes together, so you actually have you know maneuverability. But I had just missed you then, I guess. But I had I I thought I was like okay that'd be kind of weird to actually you know <laughs> wave hi yes yeah I mean if I had been uh, driving west we would have passed each other yep wouldn't have known it at the time also why the heck do I have an inch and a half long no about an inch long nail on my desk here like fingernail or wood nail wood nail why the heck do I have an inch long wood nail on my desk where did it come from what is now missing. <laughs> A nail. A nail. A one-inch nail? A one-inch nail, yeah. Uh, welcome to the joys of having children? (laughs) Oh. Question mark? The joys of having children, um, the fun fact is I get, um, so we got the Kindle Fires for the kids, and they have a two-year worry-free guarantee with them. Yeah. Which I've had to figure out how it works. Because <laughs> Isaac's Kindle had one crack on it, so I was going to, like, he had cracked the screen, but it was on the edge. Uh-huh. So I wasn't going to really worry about it. And then the other day, I look at it, and there's a serious crack right in the middle of the screen. Oops. And I'm like, hey, Isaac, when did this happen? And he's like, I don't know. And then he just hides from me under a blanket. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Yep. I I swear I didn't drive a one inch wooden nail into the screen. (laughs) No, they were building a nest with some blankets. So my guess is it happened during then because they were watching their screens in the nest with all their animals. Mm -hmm. So it's probably that's when it happened. So Hmm. I am now going through the process again of remembering how to sideload Google Play onto a kid's tablet. Oh. No. Which, that part's easy. The harder part is trying to remember how to get it onto the kid's profile. Because the kid's profile is separate from the adult profile. Right. But you need it on the kid's profile so you can install Pokemon Go so that your kids have Pokemon Go. um, Well, no, because the Kindle Fires on the kid's profile have limited location access. So we tried to get it on Isaac's profile, and there's no GPS on the Kindle fires in the kid's (laughs) profile. So the Pokemon Go, the entire time goes, I don't have a GPS. Yeah. Um, And there's a crazy, supposedly a crazy workaround where you have to get, like, Google Maps on there, and, like, you can log into Google Maps, and then Google Maps will get your general location, and from there, it's somehow can like pass the information over to pokemon go i that 
that sounds not right. I know. There's something weird, which I tried to do it for like two minutes, and then I just installed Pokemon Go on my tablet, the old tablet I picked up from Walmart. And, said, so, you know, that was his Pokemon Go tablet. And now, you know, I have the iPhone, which I use instead. Or, you know, I have the guest profile on my other phone. Sorry, Kate just messaged me. No worries. Uh, Tonight was a little different. I uh, put Megan to bed, actually, and not Isaac. So it was one of those things where it's like, what do we What do? we do? I haven't put you to bed since, you know, <laughs> you can start to speak and move on your own. So it was kind of enjoyable. Um, sorry, where was I going? That's the other thing. Welcome to, I don't, welcome welcome to kids to and yeah, trying to kids. remember what your train of thought is. Oh, the Kindle Fire and Pokemon Go. Yeah, no, Pokemon Go on the, on the Kindle Fire in the kids' profile is a pain in the butt. So I didn't even do that. But um, Amazon Kindle Fires do not have a YouTube app. Because Amazon wants you to use their competing service, which doesn't exist? I don't know. There, There is no YouTube Kids app and there's no YouTube app on the Amazon App Store. None whatsoever. So, you know, I have to go through the whole process of the Play Store and then the second Play Store which is really fun because um, when you're in the kid's profile, you cannot access the internal storage of the adult profile and vice versa. The two profiles, you cannot access the other. Yeah. I mean, like it's, it's a segregated area. You wouldn't want applications that could run in one to influence the other. That would kind of defeat the purpose. Yes. So I got, I downloaded all the files for Google Play onto one profile and then set up an FTP server on that tablet, copied it off of the tablet onto <laughs> onto the old tablet just because I had it sitting next to me and uh-huh. then switched profiles, took the old tablet, started up an FTP server on that one and then pulled those files back again into the other profile, which the entire time I'm like, this is completely ridiculous. <laughs> that I have to copy files off of the device in order to copy them right back onto the same device. I suppose if you root the device, you could probably just do it via um, um, command line. Yes, but if I remember correctly, rooting the Kindle Fires really screws up the kid's profile and all of the kid's Amazon Kids Plus stuff that goes with it, if I remember reading about that the first time. Sorry about the weird noises. Uh, I'm just noticing that my microphone is damaged. <laughs> wait, 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 what? Sorry. <laughs> it's You know the, the cross brace that goes a- across the microphone? The cross brace like, that... It goes atop, like, it starts on the side of the microphone and goes over the top and then comes back down. Not all microphones have it. My microphone does. All right, what is your microphone, just so I can picture this? Uh, it is a Samson C-01U. Okay, yeah, I see the condenser mic. All right. You see the thing that goes across the top, like a, it's a U-shaped plastic bar? Yes, that holds your wind guard in place. Is that what that is? Well, that's what the, the mesh is supposed to be, is a basic wind guard. Okay, well, it 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 broke. <laughs> <laughs> One of the sides where it is, like, inserted into the body of the microphone uh, snapped off. So it's just kind of like there but not doing anything okay huh. must have been when the microphone fell and i'm sitting here using the same usb mic for i don't know how many years i've been using this mic for a long time i do want to get it's been an effective microphone yeah no it's been good oh, it's now... taking quite a beating from me and still works just don't look at the old Plantronics headset that I've got sitting in the uh, desk next to me as my emergency backup microphone. I will not look at it. Good. You don't want to. Okay. <laughs> what are we talking about, Andy? Hi, Andy. Hello. <laughs> We're just it's catching... good to talk to you again. It's been two weeks. It's been two weeks. Not even. Because well, two weeks ago was the start of the time that we were hanging out together. Yes. So it's been a week. A week and two days. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it was so very... So don't give me this, like, it's been two weeks. Like, it's been nine days. <laughs> I um, I made, I think I told you this, I made an irrigation system for my hanging baskets. Uh, no. Oh, I made an irrigation system for my hanging baskets. Isn't that just a hose? Well, except I don't want to leave the hose on when I'm on a two-week vacation. 
<laughs> okay. So what I have, you ready? Okay. A 27-gallon storage container from Home Depot. Okay. An aquarium pump. Yep. And 50 feet of plastic tubing, clear plastic tubing. So what regulates what you got like what regulates the water flow? Like the amount of water that's going through? Yeah. It is hooked into a Casa um Wi-Fi smart outlet designed for outdoors and that is set on a schedule to run for 1 minute. <laughs> Because okay. that's all it takes, like one minute twice a day, keeps the, the baskets watered. A 27-gallon reservoir has taken three weeks. <laughs> and it's still got stuff in it. Okay, that's one way of doing it. It took me like five weeks to set this thing up and put it together. But I got it, and I have baskets that remained watered, and in fact were watered more consistently than when I was here. <laughs> No, I, I could see that. We've got some spider plants that and other gardening things that um, kind of have just gone on their own. Yep. That said, do not recommend. <laughs> it was a lot of work and a lot of money. This was yeah. not a cheap thing. You could probably cut down the price a bit. Uh-huh. But, yeah, no, it would definitely be a hack job at that point. It, it Andy, it is a hack job. I know, but I could... still expensive. I could make it even hacky, hackier. Hackier? How would you make it hackier? Uh, well, it's probably... For just... what it's worth, by the way, the water goes out. I have three different hanging baskets. So the water goes up and over and down and up and over and down and up and over and down and up and then back to the reservoir. And there are holes in the line above each basket. Hmm. So most of the water that I'm pumping is actually just coming straight back to the reservoir thinking of some sort of like five gallon bucket that you pick up at home depot and you got your hose and a pump you get one of the um those old school christmas light outlet timers you yeah know, with, with the little thing there yeah do you do you know the minimum time range on those is about five minutes um not the one that i got oh 30 minutes 30 minutes is the minimum on yours jeez yep though i did why do you think i went with the smart switch God, there was there was one that I had picked up cheap, but probably not as cheap as a smart switch now. Because smart switches are probably what around twenty bucks now. Um, something like that. I can go find out real quick because I have my Amazon account and it's a recent order. <laughs> we had we had one that I $15. had fifteen dollars. Oh geez, yeah. No, there was a timer at one of the old radio stations that would reset the phone hybrid so you, for the remote control um, every night at midnight. It would shut it down for one minute and turn it back on again five minutes. Or, yeah, it would shut it down and then five minutes later turn it back on again because it was a five-minute minimum timer in there. Mm -hmm. um, because every once in a while, the phone system would just lock up and it wouldn't be able to call out if there was a problem and you wouldn't be able to call in. It would just, just lock everything up and then lock the, the phone line. And so and they just put in a, like, hard reset? They put in a hard reset. And I'm like, well, what happens if something happens during those like five minutes where the whole system is down you're know, like oh okay so yeah I, I got a i got a smart outlet and put that in there and just cut their time down to one minute and i'm like i don't even want to deal with this old phone hybrid system this is already when i was in the process of getting to the the new job here and i'm just like i don't i don't even want to deal with that so i'm just gonna you're like i'm yeah i'm, I'm gonna cut gonna i'm gonna cut that. your downtime down to just one minute and then you know save you four minutes of you know possible off air but yeah <sighs> okay, so yeah, so you'd get the five gallon bucket, you get the old timer, but I yeah, I don't know if you could get a timer for less than fifteen. You get one hose loop and you put it up above each of the baskets, so you're not going up and down and up and down and up and down. You're just going over. Mm -hmm. And you put a hole in. Yeah, good luck aiming it. Like I said, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be, it's gonna be a hackier job. And then, yeah, you just loop that around to the thing. It, it would not be great, but... Yeah. Uh, also, your your pump that you're using is not going to have um, a connection for the hose. Well, how much are the water... I was actually just looking at that because we put up the... Um... We put up the pool again because we hadn't put mm -hmm. up we hadn't put up the little inflatable pool this year. So I'm like, well, shoot, Labor Day is next week. 
I might as well get this pool up, especially with, you know, the weather going to be in the 90s all week. Yay, August. <laughs> Perfect time for the kids <clears throat> to start school with a high of 92 yep. and a school with no air conditioning. <gasps> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, that, that does not sound pleasant. Nope. Plenty of times I went to go pick them up and all they have is those giant air handler fans just trying to move the air through the building. Yep. <clears throat> so yeah, I might I might try picking him up a little bit earlier <laughs> this week. Um, I've forgotten where I was going with that one too. <laughs> wow, we are on a roll. <laughs> you were looking up a pump, I think? Oh yeah, because I was going to try and get something to circulate the water in the, the kid's yep, pool. Yep. But I hadn't... I'd, Hadn't got in there. Well, especially since the kids' pool now has two inflatable benches, and one of them sprung a hole at the end of last year, and I thought I fixed it. And then I came out this morning, and it had deflated itself again. Oh, no. So the question uh, becomes... The pump that I got was an 880 gallons per hour submersible pump for $30. I had to get 880 gallons per hour because it had to be able to lift the water 11 feet. Mm. Yeah, no, these are way more expensive. Yeah, let's not let's not look into those. Okay. Well, should I look into the topics because I can't <laughs> figure out where to go from where yeah, we suppose. ended up. Uh, there's some news about Starship, not Star Starship, Starliner. Starliner that actually broke today. I had put, I put a topic in there going, oh, this is, this might happen today. And then literally like I had to come back in before there and find a new topic because they had actually, uh, NASA had a meeting in Houston where for a flight readiness review, and during the gathering, which included the NASA administrator and deputy administrator at the meeting, they had an informal go, no go poll for whether or not the uh, astronauts are going to come back on Starliner or not. And those present voted unanimously. No go. No go. <laughs> So didn't didn't Boeing get paid like four point six billion dollars for this? Uh, I'm not sure. I know it's not it's not a cost overrun one. It was a flat cost for this. So NASA's already paid Boeing as much as NASA is going to pay Boeing for this. So this is not the quagmire of the SLS. This is a flat cost that NASA already paid. How much? Right, Let's but, see. but that also means that the people at Boeing have already pocketed the money. It's not like NASA is going to ask Boeing for the money back. Uh, it says here, yeah, four point two billion fixed price contract. So far, Boeing has covered roughly one point six in cost overruns. Boeing should have to pay for the time it's taken to get these astronauts back. What is the cost of keeping an astronaut alive on the ISS per day? That part, I'm not sure. Well, especially, um, so the plan now is t for them to go back home on SpaceX. But their spacesuits don't work <clears throat> with the Dragon capsule. So, yep. and there's already four people on Crew 8 that are going to come home when Crew 9 gets launched. So they're actually pulling two people off of Crew 9, sending up two empty spacesuits. <laughs> and, uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and Wilmore and Williams are going to be the third and fourth member of Crew 9 and stay up there for the entire duration of Crew 9. Oh, no. And come back home when Crew 9, when crew nine. comes home next February. They went up in June? Yes. They went up for in a June. Three day eight, test run. Eight days. Eight day test eight run. Eight day test run. And they are not going to come back home now until, until February. February. Can you imagine? Just just imagine. I mean, like you 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 and Kate know there's risks with your job. You know that stuff can happen, but you're like, hey, you know, I've got this mission. I'll be gone for a week and then I'll come back. We'll we'll celebrate and then, you know, we'll see what's next. And then like four days later, you're like, so funny thing. I'm actually going to be here for a little while longer. Sorry, uh, I'm fine. Everyone's safe. There's no worries. 
Just not sure about the ride back. This continues for like a month and a half. <laughs> hey, yep, they're still not sure when we're coming back. Uh, and then finally you're like, so good news and bad news. <laughs> good news is... I know when I'm coming home. I was able to pick up an Uber. <laughs> and the bad news is it will be next year. Yeah. In February. My question, though, is how much stuff did they bring with them? Even enough just like, for eight days. Yeah. Enough clothing for did they have just enough clothing for like eight days or probably they probably it's like you you're going with like There's, an overnight bag. Right. right. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they have, like, changes of clothing, and I'm sure they have laundry. <laughs> but you're up there, you're like, I need to borrow everything. Yeah. I, I need I, to borrow one of everything, please. I thought this was just going to be a quick little thing. I just packed the overnight bag. I didn't know this was going to be an eight, eight months. Yep. Yeah. It went from eight days to eight months. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. What I know we're I know it's Saturday, so there's stock markets are not open. Is there any um I mean the some of the markets are now some things are traded 24/7. Uh you want to know what happened to Boeing? Yeah, it looks like Boeing after hours is down down just a smidge. I wouldn't expect this to be a huge hit to them. Like the market had already adjusted to it. Yeah, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's look, maybe look, next week it'll take a, a dive, but like, yeah, God, what oh a gosh. what a shit show. Boeing stock is down fifty <clears throat> percent over the past five years. Yep. Wow. Now, that said, Boeing stock is up three hundred percent from when it opened. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Not even from when it opened. Uh, the maximum range on this is the year 2000. So Boeing stock since the year 2000 has gone up 300 percent. Yeah. Boeing stock since 1984 opened at $7.96. So it is up 2,097 percent since the start. <clears throat> so like, you know, don't, you know, <laughs> it, that that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it's it's stock in the last five years is down about 50 percent, um, 20 percent this year, 30 percent since January of this year. Like they're not doing great. No, but that that merger, man, that merger with MacArthur. It, it was funny. I, I caught part of the press conference on Saturday. Or, yes, it is still Saturday. Sorry, I had to check my watch on that one. Um, and it, it was interesting to hear some of the questions that the reporters were, you know, sitting there asking about like, oh, well, the future of Starliner and this, that and the other thing. And the guy's like, look, this was not the time to look at the future of the program. <laughs> right now, all we were focusing on is two astronauts and how do we get them back home safely? That's all we were focusing on. That's good. That's, they're like, well, what about like this? What reassuring. about that? And they're like, no, no, this is, this was. Like, that's not what we're here to talk about. No. The meeting today was nothing about the long term. Oh, does this, you know, might you have to modify the contract or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, we were not looking at the contract. We're going to get two people home. We're going to get Starliner, hopefully, back home. And then we'll worry about the rest of the contract. Which my yep. my hand, it goes, OK, you know, how much is this is going to be thrown onto uh, Aerojet? Because they were the ones who actually built the thrusters that have caused all the problem. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> it was this piece of Teflon that swells up and got in the flow path and causes the oxidizer to not go into the thruster the way it needs to. That's what caused the degradation of thrust. When we saw that. I think that's when things changed a bit for us. Change being, instead of sending them back on Starliner, sending them back on SpaceX. When NASA took this finding to the thrusters manufacturer, Aerojet Rock and Dye, and the propulsion company said it had never seen this phenomenon before. That is not what you want to hear. Yeah, we don't know what happened. Like, it's just, you know, it, it's just doing a thing. Like, it's doing a thing. Yeah, it's just doing a thing. A thing that you've never seen it do before. Yeah, you realize that's worse, right? <laughs> what? I mean, you're what? telling us that you cannot explain what's going on. It's just happening. Oh, uh, no, man. No, it's all good. It's it's all it's great. It's all good. Don't worry about it. Just don't worry. Don't worry at all. So once again, SpaceX steps in, helps yeah. a competitor. Yeah. Well, helps some astronauts. Yes, helps helps Look, some astronauts. This is this is not helping their competitor. No. In any way shape or form. Helping their competitor 
would have been sending engineers to Boeing to say, let's take a look at this and figure out what's going on and how we can stop it. Yep. That would be helping their competitor. This is taking advantage of a situation and Making helping... Making sure that, you know, U.S. astronauts get home safely. Right. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll put it down to that altruistic thing. So, other space news. Uh, Polaris Dawn is all set for launch this week. Polaris Dawn was the private mission that's going to be going up on a crew dragon and will do the first commercial spacewalk. I'm that's uh, hmm 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 hmm. Yep. So the it, the spacewalk's going to be on the third of the five day mission. Um, but preparations are actually going to be happening um, basically right after launch where they're going to start uh, adjusting the atmospheric pressure and oxygen concentration inside the capsule because um, the whole capsule is going to be brought to a vacuum. So everybody in the, in the, in the, the capsule is going to have to put on EVA suits. Two of them are actually going to step out and do the spacewalk. Um, but yeah, all, all four of them are going <laughs> to... You're going to be up there in that space capsule, and they're going to literally just open the hatch just to have people just walk out. Well, I mean, if you go back to, like, the early spacewalks. Yes, that, I know. That that's makes... Like, yeah, we're talking, that's exactly what they did for uh, Gemini. Gemini right? and Apollo, right? Yep. Like, I mean, Apollo didn't include spacewalks. No, that was, um, what was the one right But they did Gemini? go out onto the moon. Yes. By depressurizing the entire capsule. Yes. <clears throat> I think it was Gemini where they actually did um, out extravehicular spacewalk. Yes. I think that was Ed. Yeah, it was Ed White during the first spacewalk in 1965. Was that? Yep, Gemini four. Wow, how quickly I can get this information now. So that's going to be you want you want quick information, man. Like I asked Chat GPT to help me draft a letter today, and it was blazingly fast. But, I I put my letter of resignation in through Chat GPT. Really? Yes, my letter of resignation at the old job. I think it was I, your suggestion. Probably. I I, I said because I didn't know what to say. I'm like, yep. hey, can oh, that's I? right. No, I remember that now. Because I wanted to, I wanted to give him a, a letter of resignation, but I also really did not want to burn any bridges whatsoever. Yep. <clears throat> so I, I told Chappie GPT exactly what I wanted, and they came out with a very, you know, basic letter, and I, I just, you know, told it what to modify. And yeah, I had sent it to a bunch of other people like, that was a good letter. And I'm just in my head going, yeah, that was not me. <laughs> I didn't write it. Like, I did not write that at all. Uh, other last bit of space news here, China scientists, because China had the, um, the moon landing mission, which brought back moon dirt. Mm -hmm. Um, they have discovered some new ways to actually extract water from the lunar soil. Huh. That's actually like really important. Yes. When analyzing the samples, researchers from the Chinese Academy of Sciences found that the moon dirt contained high concentrations of hydrogen and oxygen along with other elements. So they're able to get water vapor just by heating up the dirt. I mean, okay, so here's the thing, and I don't know how this speaks to NASA. Are you telling me we didn't try that? We never tried, I don't know, baking the dirt? Uh, well, it had to be heated to temperatures exceeding 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, so we had to really bake the dirt. I, okay, I, I guess that's... <laughs> I would have, I probably would have put it in at like 500. I don't think I would have gotten it to 1800 degrees. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, my, my, my uh, whirlpool oven does not go that high. Right. Those elements produced water vapor. Wait a second. <laughs> Hang on. You, you don't just get oxygen and hydrogen and heat it to 1800 degrees and get water. I I'm mean, you do, but like, that's when you burn it. it. If you ignite hydrogen with oxygen, do you get water off of that reaction? Well, I feel like I have to read The Martian again, because <laughs> if I remember correctly, there is something that he does to get water because he needs to water all the potatoes. Yeah, he burns rocket fuel. He burns, um, was it hydrogen hexafluoride or something like that? I don't I don't remember. I'll have like I said, I have to read it again. Which is not a bad thing. It's a good book. Oh. 
According to the researchers, a ton of moon soil could produce 13 gallons of water. Okay, but a ton of soil is a lot of soil. Yes, but also trying to get 13 gallons of water up on a spaceship... Is also very heavy. Yes. And if you could leave it behind... But where are you getting the energy to bake something at 18,000 degrees? I don't know. <clears throat> You'd need a kiln. I mean, I guess you could put a couple... Oh, shit. Uh, okay, wait. How hot does... What's the name of that one tower? Oh, that, that melted salt one? Yeah. Molt, what is that molten salt one? Helios. It's Helios. It's the Helios Tower. Okay. Uh, I love so that Helios. I knew exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, well, because I've played Fallout. Um, <laughs> Helios Solar Energy. Helios Solar. Helios Sol. No, I want the tower. It is Helios, right? I, I, I don't see... Crescent Dunes Solar Energy Project. Helios CSP. Why is this in not English? There's a Crescent Dunes Solar Energy Project in Nevada. Oh, okay. In Fallout, it is called Helios 1. Ah. I'm pretty sure it's called Helios in the real world. The Ivanpah Solar Power Facility, Nevada Solar One. All right, it's just called Nevada Solar One, apparently. Not actually Helios. Uh, uh, how hot does it get? 752 degrees Fahrenheit, according to... That's it? Yeah, Crescent Dunes was the first tower CSP with thermal storage. Yeah, uh, uh, storage tank. <laughs> Project generated controversy. Uh... <laughs> It just it kills birds. <clears throat> oh, there's a Wikipedia article of list of solar thermal power stations in the world. Okay, does anything get? I wanted. I want to know the heat. I don't care about the energy. I guess I could configure. I could figure out the energy based on the heat. I want to know how hot they get. <clears throat> hundred megawatts. How hot can a hundred megawatts get water? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, current state-of-the-art CSP plants use nitrate slash nitrite-based salts and a steam power conversion cycle. The salt is used as both the something-something in practice. Nitrate salts are limited to peak temperatures of 565. That's according to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The Department of Energy is developing technologies that can raise the temperature to approximately 720 degrees Celsius. So that's hot. That is 1328 degrees Fahrenheit. So close. Yes. So the what DOE they they... is working on it, but that they're not getting up to 1800 yet, but they are no. getting but, closer. But so, so the reason I'm bringing this up is... Um, there's no atmosphere on the moon. Oh, so there's nothing blocking the light. Right. Like, the day side of the moon is already really hot. And it's continuous. Yeah, day side is at 224 degrees Fahrenheit. And it is continuous for yes. 14 days. Yep. <laughs> so, like... 14 days of just continuous heat. You could probably set something up with a, a number of mirrors. I don't know how many mirrors you'd need. I don't know, but this could be a thing now. You know, once we actually start landing people on the moon again. Hello, SLS at some point. <laughs> if we're lucky. Yep. Oh, <laughs> speaking of Starship, this is not on the list because it's not a real big topic, but sure. the FCC has given their approval for the next Starliner, not Starliner, Starship launch. Woo! So they've got the they've got the communications license all set up. So now you're once again still waiting on the they FAA. Need the FAA. Yes. The aviation, they need the actual like air clearance to launch. Yes. <clears throat> They, but they're given. They've been getting the go ahead for the Starlink communications. So it's a small step, but it is a step forward. Yeah. Well, um, something silly that came out. Sure. Well, there's two. Two. two there's, there's a couple of silly topics on here. First off, Chick Fil A is starting up their own streaming service. Good for them. <laughs> I 
I hate that company. Yes. They are going to have a streaming service expected to focus on family-friendly content and include original TV shows. And supposedly they are paying up to $400,000 for unscripted content. So they just want like some YouTube creators. I guess or so. They, they're, they want like improv, like unscripted content. Well, unscripted content is kind of like game shows or reality TV. But it needs to be family friendly. Yes. So you're talking family friendly to Chick-fil-A's standards. Yes. So yeah, something along the lines of like um, 12 kids in counting or 18 kids in counting or whatever the Duggars got up to before people learned about the Duggars. And yeah, Chick-fil-A is already looking to license an unnamed family friendly game show from the production company that makes The Wall. I haven't seen The Wall, so I don't know. I have not either. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, Chick-fil-A starting their own streaming service. Huh. That's weird. Um, Valve that's, that's is... just dumb. I'm... Ah. Valve it's, is it's banning... It's just a Chick-fil-A sponsored one. Valve is banning keyboards. All? No. That, I mean, that's an interesting way to get people to use the Steam Deck. <laughs> Valve is banning Counter-Strike 2 players from using specific keyboards that have added simultaneous opposing <clears throat> cardinal directions. Okay. The Razer was the first maker to add that, and they're calling it Snap Tap. What's and the advantage? Well, normally in Counter-Strike, if you press one direction and then you press the other direction, the opposite direction, instead of going the opposite direction, because you have two of them pressed down, you yeah. will go nowhere. You will just stop. Okay. So you can't, you can't, you know, zigzag back and forth unless you, you know, have that muscle memory and you work on that constant, you know, very quick switching. Then like for, for strafing, right? Yes. Okay. So normally these... you would have to, you would have to release one key and then press the other key. So, you know, the amount of time that you have switching between the two of them, you're also not moving. So yeah, if you press both of them, they'll cancel each other and you'll stand there for a moment until you release one of the keys. But this uh, snap tap allows you to have both keys down at the same time and you can rapidly tap to strafe back and forth without having to get that, you know, snap muscle memory. Interesting. So if you have this keyboard and you're playing Counter-Strike 2 on Valve's official servers, you will be Knocked kicked. Off the server. You'll be kicked from the game. Yep. Your account will not be banned yet, but... These keyboards are now banned from the game. They say some hardware features have blurred the line between manual input and automation, so we've decided to draw a clear line on what is or isn't acceptable in Counter-Strike. This this is this yes. is on the other side of the line. Yes, we are no longer going to allow automation via scripting or hardware that circumvent those core skills. And moving forward, players suspected of automating multiple player actions from a single game input may be kicked from their match. I'm I, I, I do have to say I am glad this was not in WoW back then because oh my gosh, so many scripts in yep. the WoW interface during raiding made life. I mean, Blizzard locked that down a bit. Yes, but back in the day, it was said like, no, you can't do this. There were ones there where it was just literally a button in the center of the screen. And it and just kept cycling through the best option. Yes. Yeah. Civ 7. Yes. There was a lot of info because Gamescom was, uh, it's a game, Gamescom? Com. Com. Gamescom was uh, last week or this weekend. Um, and so Civ 7, there was a lot of information that came out about Civ 7. The interesting Yay. fact is that. Called uh, it. I, I told you that they were working on it. Yeah. It said like two years ago, like they've got to be working on seven by now. And if they're announcing it now, they've definitely been working on it for at least two years. Yes. It is going to be coming out, I do believe, in February. February. Yeah. yeah. Which means it's probably about time to buy Civilization Six. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I do I have six or do I have five? Go to my desktop. No, that's a that's a V. That is a V. That is not a V and I. I'm pretty sure nope, nope, I have nope. six. I have six. There are six right there, right next to the five. I have way I'm too pretty many sure, yeah, icons I have six. on my desktop. Uh, for what it's worth, six is currently six dollars until September second. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll probably go and just buy the like platinum edition with all bundle. of the with all of the DLC, all, all the DLC, all the expansions, and so then I just like have that. 
because like yeah now it's, it's buy buy a civ game when the next one comes out yeah rise and fall dlc is five dollars right now is that included in this stuff or is that a separate i don't know i'm looking at the downloadable content available for civ ah, 6 gathering storm rise and fall uh which are both in my library apparently i already have all of it <laughs> Well then, I guess it's time to start playing Civilization Six. I yeah, only but have Civ seven. I only have one item on here. One of nineteen items in this bundle is in your library. That's it. That's a lot of bundle. Mm-hmm. Which bundle is that? Uh, the Civilization Six <laughs> Anthology bundle. Civ Six anthology twenty five dollars your price twenty dollars because it has the rise and fall expansion the gathering storm expansion new frontier pass and the leader pass and all the civilizations yep catherine de medici huh huh yep but civ 7 they've said that leaders are not going to be locked into their civilizations so yes so i could have like gandhi leading the russians yes interesting Mm -hmm. so that means they're what they're going to do is like traditionally when you pick well but they they sort of started to do that i think in six where there were different leaders for the same civilization yes yes there were they had already split the leader bonus from the civ bonus so this is just an extension of that yes They have cut the number of historical eras to just three. (gasps) No more like ancient, renaissance, medieval? Nope, just antiquity, exploration, and modern. Okay, I wonder what their reasoning was. Simplification? I'm guessing. Antiquity, exploration, and modern. Mm -hmm. And then within each chapter are the paths or goals the player pursues within each path arranged into one of four categories— economic military cultural and science so in order to advance the eras you have to do things like in the economic uh path is establish several trade routes or amass a wide variety of resources that other world leaders would pay to trade with you also players will be able to change their civilization at different points throughout the game so there it it sounds like they might be borrowing a few of the ideas from millennia the idea of like changing your civ as it grows and and go except millennia went the other direction instead of reducing the number of eras they like massively increased it (laughs) the game keeps track of the decisions players made at different points throughout the game and the legacy paths that they pursued out of those previous four, then when a player progresses to the next chapter of history, they'll get a new civilization to lead based on their choices. Huh. So your civilization will modify as it grows. Yes, based off of what you have done previously in the game. So if you're like aggressive early game, you might get an aggressive... This kind of makes... like the So the thing I'm thinking of is like the special unit that each Civ gets. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And how those special units appear in different eras. Yes. And so this is just like combining that. Well, this is going to be very interesting to see. <clears throat> Are you going to pick it up? I don't know. I definitely do not have a computer that can run it. Fair. So. You, huh. That, that might answer a question I've been having, actually. I've been trying to decide what to do with this computer, Andy. <laughs> Well, it's like eight or nine years old at this point. I'm trying to even remember how old this uh, this laptop is. I'm trying. Let's see. This it's an Acer, right? Yes, it is an Acer. Yeah. Oh, um, while we're talking about games that were revealed at Gamescom, uh, Peter Molyneux is back. Yeah, I heard he was coming out with another God type game. Question mark. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it, it's called Masters of Albion, and I. <laughs> It sounds like Molyneux has stepped back from himself and said, I do this thing where I tell people features that are going to be in a game that aren't actually in the game, and then my developers get really mad at me, and the public gets really mad at me, so I'm going to try and only talk about what's actually in the game. And then goes on to talk about, like, some of his favorite games that he made, Black and White, uh, uh, Dungeon Keeper the original fable and he's like i'm what i'm trying to do is take the best elements of each of these and turn that into a game hmm. i have mixed feelings on this yeah <laughs> my laptop is from september of 2014 so i'm almost reaching my 10 year mark on this laptop 
it is not aged well, by the way. No. Ah, man, I really liked Black and White, but anything else from him, I'm not sure if I've liked it. You liked Dungeon Keeper, no? You played Evil Genius. Yes, yes, that is true, yes. based on Dungeon Keeper. Based off of Dungeon Keeper, yes. I do enjoy Evil Genius, that was good. But that wasn't him, That that was a different studio that was doing the same kind of thing. Yes. Just trying to think if there's anything. Let me look up his... Uh, his history. Yeah. <laughs> Some messy stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, hey, Valve's secret game isn't a secret anymore. No, they've officially announced it. Hold on, let me get back to that tab so I can open up the link on that. Yes, it's called Deadlock, and it's basically um, Overwatch, Dota 2, and Team Fortress 2 all put together. So, Overwatch? <laughs> Six-on-six shooter, where your team of heroes attempt to dominate a map by, you know, pushing them back. Yep. But you're also leading an army of NPC grunts down four different lanes to destroy opposing teams' stationary defenses. Huh. So it's a first-person Dota 2. Yes. Interesting. It's a constant respawning and advancing. They can't break through without your help, but humans can't easily break through as well without the NPC help. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Deadlock, huh? Deadlock, yep. There is indeed a Valve page for it. It's in early announce and uh, early access, early development. Lots of temporary art and experimental gameplay. Access is currently limited to friend invite via via our play testers. So if you get someone, if you know someone who has it, they can invite you. I'll add it to my wish list. Why not? There are twenty different heroes to play, so we'll uh, see how it goes. Yep. Okay. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, that's an excellent question. Oh, we're over already. Okay. Is there anything you want to talk about from... I snuck most of it in. Okay. Uh, that, uh, uh... Oh, the interesting thing there is the fact that Xbox announced at Gamescom that Indie, their exclusive game, is actually not going to be a true exclusive, just a timed exclusive. Cool. So everybody freaking out that, you know, Xbox is going to hold things close to the vest. But like... Phil Spencer said he doesn't think that games should be exclusive anymore. Yep. He he said, like, he said, we want to put these games on as many platforms as possible because other, like, we want that market. Yes. It's still a bad idea to have one studio own so much. Yes. But, sure, like, he's, he's in on this, like, multi-platform thing. Well, he said that, because they had already released those previous four games, uh that had like Sea of Thieves and I can't remember what the other ones were but there were the the four ones that they released earlier this year as multi-platform and he said look those games came out and we looked at the numbers and the numbers didn't go down that that was their worry it's like okay if we open this up to everybody are we going to you know are we literally eating our own you know eating our own I was going to say eating our own food but that doesn't work <laughs> Uh, eating our own stock? Possibly. Something like that. Like, as as a restaurant, when you eat your own stock? Yeah. That's generally a bad idea? Yes. And the, the, <laughs> they were expecting, yeah, they thought their numbers were going to go down as people moved to other platforms, but it didn't, it didn't happen that way. So they're like, okay, well... I guess this is okay. And especially because probably everybody at Microsoft is wondering how they're going to make back that $69 billion paid to acquire Activision Blizzard. Um, I mean, World of Warcraft. <laughs> in, in time, like, how long does it take WoW to make $69 billion? I don't know. <clears throat> there was entirely tangential, but I, uh, one of my Facebook groups is I take a picture of transmitter sites. Um, okay. Just because I'm fascinated in that sort of thing there. Somebody took a picture of a cruise ship that had um, 15 Starlinks on it. Jesus Christ, what are they doing? It's a cruise ship, so they're need, they need bandwidth. Yep. So $1,500 $1, a month for those. And the guy's like, well, how much, you know, how are they going to make that back? And then he posted the prices that they were charging all of the users. Minimum it's insane. Yeah, minimum price for one day for internet access was eighteen dollars. Yeah. So it's like okay, and you how get, many thousands of people? Yeah, you get fifty people to pay eighteen dollars on this cruise ship. You know, boom. <laughs> there's there's your money right there. Yeah. All right. So 
random review. It is your review, Dave. I would like to review the OSM tracker for Android. So I might have gotten into this at exactly the wrong time. <laughs> but oh, okay. Niantic, up to now, has used OpenStreetMaps for their location information because they are no longer part of Google, so they can't use Google Maps yes, for free. Makes sense. But they can use OpenStreetMaps because it's open. Yeah. And so what, what Niantic has done is like every couple of years, they download a, a full copy of the OSM data, and then that's their map. They might be changing that, like, literally now, but that's <laughs> besides the point. Um, at work, we've been doing a lot of construction, mm -hmm. and we've updated the building that I'm in, and the, the area around the building has changed, the walking paths have changed, the uh, water features have changed, which is to say there's now a lake surrounding the building. And I was getting tired of not having that in Pokemon Go and Ingress, and I wanted to get it into OpenStreetMap so that I could get it into Niantic's maps and the Niantic data. So I downloaded this neat little application called OSM Tracker, which is just a GPS tracker, which you already have in your phone. But it records the, you know, the points that you're at throughout the time once you click start tracking. Um, and it has options for like adding notes or adding um, recordings or video or pictures, um, as you are going along the trip. And that is a very simple system. Now the, the UI was a little weird to like get into. Like I didn't understand what all the buttons meant <laughs> until I realized that the first level of buttons, like you've, you've three buttons at the top, which are like, take a recording, take a photo or write a note. And those are immediate, like here, where you're at, we will record that. The other buttons are all categories to add features to your tracking. They, they're basically like quick notes. Um, but then the cool thing is you can authorize this with OpenStreetMap, with your account on OpenStreetMap, and you can upload the track to OSM, which you can then use to overlay against the OpenStreetMap in the editor, and you can edit OpenStreetMap with the, the track that you recorded right there. So if you ah. walk down the middle of a sidewalk and then upload that, it's really easy to add where that sidewalk should be in OpenStreetMap. Well, that should be very nice. So I've been able to update uh, the the sidewalks and the water features and the beach that are all right around where my building is. I'm trying to remember if we used we we had some weird map for the census when we did it in 2010. And I don't remember if it was open street map or not. But yeah, they had a thing like that there where it's like, no, there's because the map was, I think, 10 years old at that point. Um, so there was a lot of updating and a lot of going, OK, this, you know, where is this road? And then it's literally like, OK, walk the road. And then I walk it and I stop at the corner and I hit stop. And it's like, oh, there's a road here now. Um, but no, that would be. Could you is there anything you can do with Pokemon Go like um, routes and that sort of stuff or no? I mean, not in in this editor okay but like if you wanted to plan out routes it helps to have those routes in open street map first hmm. well now i'm just wondering how off are the maps in my area but i'll have to take a look on that but you're saying this might not be a <laughs> permanent thing then or well um niantic is moving away from at least rumor is niantic is moving away from using osm data to some other data set hmm. possibly because people are abusing osm to add things into pokemon go like parks that aren't actually there so that gyms can be labeled as ex gyms ah oh also the the pokestop that is next to the cabin is now a gym what so tell your brothers, I'm the, if they're headed up there, like they, they can start playing Pokemon Go. They've got a stop and a gym right there, both in range of the cabin. Now I have to look up uh, Campfire just to see what's going on up there now. That's how I knew it was a gym is it's on Campfire. Wow. Oh, that's cute. Someone added the Lakeshore Public Beach access to uh, OpenStreetMap, including the Lakeshore Public Beach. Well, look at that right there. <clears throat> oh, man. Why would you want to take that route? <laughs> 
There's a route that goes from the Bar Lake access all the way basically to Burger King. Why would I mean, you that's a long walk. walk but... That is a long walk, especially up the hill by the state park and then all the way back down again. Yep. Oh, you're you're going to hatch an egg. <laughs> yeah. Yup. <sighs> Well, is there any, this is entirely free software? Is it been? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's part of OpenStreetMap, so yes, it is definitely free. Okay, and it looks like it was actually recently updated too, so that's good. So, all right. Well, if you want to update what you got going on, this would be a way to do it. Yep. All right. Random topic time. Rolled ahead of time. Random topic, episode 664 at 40 minutes and 20 seconds. Andy says... OMG, Pineapple at Meyer, a whole pineapple, is on sale for 87 cents. David responds with, that's pretty good, Andy, but for an item that is literally used to be a status symbol. Are pineapples now a status symbol? I don't know. Probably not. You can just buy them at the store. I mean, you go to Costco and there is literally a pallet full of pineapples for like $2. Right. So I don't, I don't think they are. They're good. I do enjoy the pineapple, but no, they are, they are, if, if you can get it for under $5, it's not a status symbol. (laughs) That's, that's a fair way of putting it. Also like, yeah, it's not a status symbol. No, it used to be. Yes. As we've talked about this, I'm, (laughs) this is entirely, once again, another random tangential thing, but Hey, that's That's why people listen to the podcast. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Shout out to Don, by the way. It was why I was in Ann Arbor. Um, That was... Oh, my God. Okay, so that was even weirder. So... Andy, focus. Yes. It's been... It's been a heck of a day. Right. Pineapple. My parents went to Hawaii for some vacation. They got a fresh pineapple, and then they brought it back, and then they let it sit for two weeks before they opened it up to eat it. Gross. Yeah. I... St- I came back to their house and I'm looking and I'm like, that's that. It, what's wrong with that pineapple? They're like, oh, we got that from Hawaii. We were going to, you know, carve it up and have it with, you know, the, the family meal that we were having. And I'm just like, oh, my God, that is going to be the worst pineapple ever. Why? You got the fresh pineapple. You eat the fresh pineapple when it's fresh. You do not let it sit there <laughs> for two for weeks. For a week. Two weeks. It was there for two weeks. That's that's gross. Yes. Yes, it was. That is indeed gross. That is my horrible pineapple story for the day. I think that's my only horrible pineapple story. I don't think I've got any other horrible pineapple stories. No, wait a second. No, no, no. There is a pineapple that would be a status symbol. There was a pineapple. I think it was a pink pineapple. The pink glow pineapple, I think. I mean, I saw a pink pineapple at Hy-Vee. There was some pineapple that cost like $200. I think it was two hundred dollars. Let's see, two hundred dollars. Oh, sorry, four hundred dollars. That that could be a status symbol. But I mean, like within a certain level, that's a status symbol. Yes. Ruby glow pineapples. There were only five thousand available globally because they take two years to grow on a farm in Costa Rica. So yes, a ruby glow pineapple, four hundred dollars. Which, of course, um, when you buy it, they have, like, 0% of the stem there, so you can't even try and grow your own. Grow your own. They are sold without their crowns and come in elegantly designed packaging. So, yes, that might be that might be a status symbol, paying yep. $400 for, for a pineapple. pineapple. I could get behind that being a status symbol. Yes. Or at I, least I, a flex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's like, that's have to be a deep flex, because if you post that online, then you have to probably like post a whole link going, this is exactly what I bought, see? Because otherwise you'd be like, why are you posting a pineapple on your Instagram? La-di-da, it's a pineapple. And then you're like, oh, that's a $400 pineapple. Well then. That's, that's the price. But then my question is not like, oh my God, you can afford a $400 pineapple. It's, why did you spend $400 <laughs> on a pineapple? They're like five bucks. <laughs> At the grocery store. It's a banana. How much could it cost? Five dollars? <laughs> oh, out of touch with people. Mm-hmm. Well, on that, that's a wrap. This has been another episode of the Random Access Podcast. 
you have any questions, comments, concerns, corrections, suggestions, remarks, reviews, rebukes, retorts, or just rants, feel free to contact us. You can find us on Twitter at RAPodcast or send us an email at mail at RAPodcast.net. Thank you for listening. <laughs>